In the quest for truth, it's an awful lot more important to figure out how to think correctly, how to think clearly, rather than to learn what to believe. Because if you can think clearly, then you can come to conclusions about things that you can really own. And what I mean is you can really be convinced of them because you've worked it out. It's not just something that someone told you and the, that you maybe half understand but don't fully understand. So in that spirit, let's talk about one of the logical fallacies that's a particularly pernicious one. It's called the false alternative. And this is one that had me in its grip for almost two decades. And I'm talking about the struggle I had between Christianity and atheism. So, <clears throat> the false alternative is basically when you are presented with two options, or three options, or four options, but you're made to think that these are the only options, that there isn't another one that you're just not seeing. So here in the West, there are two prevalent worldviews. One of those is Christianity, and the other one is atheism. So you have, on the one hand, the idea of God as a person with all the trappings of, of, uh, of uh, authoritarian religion. He's depicted in a certain way as your saviour, as your king, as your father. God the person, the literal being of God. Anthropomorphic. There's a big word for you, but it really just means uh, putting the characteristics of man onto something that is not man. Uh, so anyway, that's the idea of God that we're presented with. <clears throat> and the Christian will sometimes make the argument, well, if you don't believe in God, all you're left with is a completely accidental universe, a mechanical universe of billiard balls that is completely without meaning and that you can't really come to grips with, you can't really understand. It has no purpose. It's all just a, a big mindless machine. <clears throat> And there are many people who believe that. But I couldn't make either of these two worldviews work in a way that was satisfying. And by satisfying, I just don't mean emotionally satisfying, although I do mean that. I mean also intellectually satisfying. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I couldn't make them work is because both were not true. And I thought it had to be one or the other. I was in the grip of the false alternative fallacy. But there was a third side, more than even a third side. I just hadn't, I didn't have the, uh, the sense to go looking elsewhere to see what other people said on the issue of God or on the issue of the meaning of life. Now that I'm very well read from a great many sources, I can pick from a great many more options. I can pick not randomly, but pick the one that makes the most sense. And the one that makes the most sense is that we might choose the word God, but use it in a more metaphorical sense, not in reference to a literal being that we have clearly invented because we've put our own characteristics onto that being. But God is like a pointer to something that we can't possibly understand. Because the billiard ball universe, the universe that is just a machine, makes no sense on its own. Especially when you ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there a big machine, the universe? Why does that exist? How does that exist? How does a state of complete thermodynamic equilibrium, pure nothingness, how does that become the Big Bang. It can't unless there is something beyond itself, something that transcends space-time. So that is what I was looking for. The thing that you can't understand, that you can't wrap your mind, up, mind around because it transcends space-time, but you know it must be there. It must be there behind everything that you see and feel and touch the transcendent. Don't turn it into a person.
person. That's just us making stuff up because we haven't got the sense to let a mystery be a mystery. Okay? So that was my way out of that false alternative. And it was a false alternative. I just couldn't see it. So that was the big one for me. But there are more. And people use them. Um, the one that jumps to my mind from my Christian experience was the one where, <clears throat> you know the way Christianity can seem like a form of slavery, slavery to God, you are a servant of God. But then it also uses terms like, we have freedom in Christ. This was explained to me as freedom from slavery to the self. Okay? So the idea was you can either have a life of service to God where you do what he says, allowing you to become free from your carnal appetites, or you can indulge your carnal appetites and become a complete slave to the self. So that, that makes a kind of sense, but it's the same fallacy, it's the false alternative. It's the view that there's nothing in between these two extreme polarities, these polarized views. And the place in between, uh, it's perfectly obvious to me, uh, but it was it was described very well by Anton LaVey, where he used the term indulgence, not compulsion. Indulgence is not the same thing as compulsion. Yeah? So we indulge our carnal appetites, but we know when to stop. It's kind of like saying, you know, the Christian is almost saying that if you didn't have a God to instruct you not to be a glutton, you would automatically eat and eat and eat until you became obese. When we know that's not true, we don't need supernatural guidance to understand that food tastes great, we enjoy it, we indulge that appetite, but we know when to stop because there are consequences. So we are not a slave in that extreme sense to our appetites, you see? So the whole uh, freedom in Christ is freedom from slavery to the self. It's, it's fallacious, completely. I'm not obese. I'm carrying a little bit of weight, but I'm not, I'm not obese. I know when to stop. You know, um, I eat an awful lot more healthier than most people my age. It's just after lunch and I've just finished <clears throat> a vegetarian salad that I enjoyed and I am now enjoying a banana and coconut and pineapple smoothie courtesy of Asda <laughs> <clears throat> so the false alternative rears its head another place where we hear about it is um, in ideas about what is the self what is what is the self so the, the idea that we inherited is that you have a soul, that there is kind of like a little man in here that is your, the true you, who is your personality containing all your memories and everything. And it goes somewhere at death. Or even if you want to believe, believe in it just in the sense of the mind, not, not as a soul, not as an immortal soul, but as just the psyche, a thing that sits in here that is not material in nature. And maybe you believe that if you want to take a more modern perspective on it, that it's here and it dies when you die. It finishes when you die. The, the generally presented alternative to this is that uh, consciousness is an illusion. That you're not really here. That this is all just chemistry. You are an automaton, a robot essentially, a meat robot. That's a complete denial of experience. Um, you see, we could understand how we could create an NPC, non-player character, I think that means inside a computer game, that would have certain behavior patterns and it would walk around the, the arena and it would do certain things and interact in certain ways. And we know even though it's doing those things, it is not conscious in the sense that you are conscious. There's something else going on here that can't really be explained as just chemistry doing a machine-like thing, you see? 
So people in the scientific community, because they don't believe in the soul, because they have a materialistic view of the universe, they conclude absurdly that consciousness is not real. But you see, you don't have to believe in the soul. You don't have to believe in the spiritual psyche as an alternative to non-consciousness. There's a third side. And the third side is the idea that what we call consciousness is a kind of lens. It's not a thing in itself. If you imagine the universe as a oneness, a kind of quantum mechanical oneness, if you like, um, where everything is entangled with everything, nothing is separate, that it's not truly physical, that this is just a great big unified field. Okay? And this oneness manifests itself down here in this matrix-like reality as apparent separateness through points of locality. So this here isn't a little man sitting in here, it's a lens that the universe looks through. So down here, it's, if you imagine there's, a, there's like a cone going out above my head to some unified field, I don't know, don't know what else to call it, that's the scientific term for it. And it just becomes focused inside creatures. And then those creatures feel like they are mobile, separate things, separate from the universe itself, but they're not, they are the universe. They are, they are the universe made manifest. The only true I is the universe, hence the title of my book. So that, that's the alternative to believing in either a soul on the one hand or just mechanical chemistry that's non-conscious on the other. It's the third option, which you don't see unless you're aware of the false alternative fallacy. Um, Carl Sagan's book, The Demon Haunted World, has a really good chapter. I think he calls it the, the baloney detection kit, where he goes through a lot of logical fallacies. Uh, it's well worth reading. Um, so yeah, there you go. So anytime someone presents you with uh, a series of options, typically two, but it can be more than two, <clears throat> before you side with one or the other, Always ask yourself, is there a third side?